Good day, Tiagi. Uh, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today. Could you please start us off by doing a brief introduction about yourself and your experience in the L&D world? Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Yes, in terms of a brief introduction, this is the brief first. I don't want to tell anything about me. Let my actual presentation introduce me. In terms of the L&D world, hi folks, would you believe I have been in this business longer than Guy, which is almost an impossible thing, but I have been doing this for 92 years. I have been training and educating people at the elementary school level, high school level, undergraduate level, graduate level, and nowadays, I spend most of my time training corporate participants around the world. Yes, thank you. Uh, I did uh, first come across you in 1980 when I joined the National Society for Performance and Instruction, and you were an old guy then, so I'm surprised you're still around. But uh, let's go for the main event here for this video series. Could you please give us your five or 10 minute or 30 minute uh, thoughts on measuring the impact of instruction in an enterprise context. Thank you. I'll be happy to do that, Guy. And I conduct a course on evaluation and measurement. It's a semester-long course. It used to be a semester-long course. I'm trying to do it in less than 30 minutes today. Okay, the first one I tell people and I warn people that I tend sometimes stupidly, idiotically use the term evaluation and measurement as if they are uh, synonyms. They mean different things, related by different things. And evaluation is finding the value of, let us talk in terms of l and finding the value, let us say, of the training you do. That is evaluation. Measurement is supply, supplying objective, valid, reliable data to back up your evaluation efforts. So measurement, is a necessary but not sufficient element of doing evaluation. Having said that, let me set up the stage of measurement in an evaluation learning context. What do you measure? And you measure products, you measure processes, you measure people. For example, if I were going to measure enough information about what I'm doing today, so you can evaluate it. And more importantly, the people listening to me can evaluate it. A sample of the product could be my laptop ah, and my lighting. Wow. So I'm supposed to look prettier when they turn that light on. So that is a product measurement. And the procedure, am I able to make people think that this is a conversation and how am I doing my presentation and is it useful and is it interesting? So two items I can measure on many other things. And the paper, between Tiagi and the guy. Let's take guy. Uh, how does the guy look when he takes his glasses off and the things of that? Okay, he looks much younger without his glasses. So that is paper measurement. So when you're measuring, you can measure products, processes, or procedures, and the paper. So that is one part of it. And if you forget it, that's okay. I'm just trying to impress you. And 
the second thing, important thing, I hope you won't forget it, is you're measuring for a purpose. You're measuring to feed data to evaluation, and the evaluation has two different purposes. Therefore, measurement has two different purposes. These two purposes are formative and summative. Formative is to improve your training package, to improve this session. Summative is to prove, is to certify, is to validate your session. You need to measure and collect the data. Uh, for example, formative measurement will be Tyagi has a funny accent, so not too many people understand him. That is formative data. And the evaluation is, we should replace Tyagi with the guy because he knows everything about the impact of instruction in, the, in the enterprise learning context. But so that is formative evaluation. Summative evaluation goes something like of the 13 people who listened to this particular session next week, three people immediately changed the way they have been doing measurement by adding new instruments or new strategies. So the purpose for your measurement could be to improve your training or to prove your training works and start charging money. One other item in the background, what is your focus? Hey, we are all instructional designers. We have been brainwashed by Guy and others to say, you cannot do training unless you have specific behavioral objectives. Your objectives should have antecedents, should have behaviors, and they should have criteria for measuring the behavior. So if the objectives are perfectly stated, it is easy. You convert them into a measuring instrument. This is good, but I have had many occasions where I trained a physician, for example, I can show summatively the operations they conducted were successful, but all of the patients died. So we have to take into account not only the objectives we are trying to achieve, but we got to keep an open mind and say, what are some of the side effects? So I have a wonderful mathematics course on how to do differential, how to solve differential equations. People are able to do it, but they hate this stuff so much, they never use it. So what are goal-based measurement, which I usually do, and we all do, and what are goal-free measurement, which means what are unpredictable, unforce, unforeseen consequences, which could be positive or negative. So that is in terms of background about measurement. And when I talked to Guy, he said, you got to talk about what to measure and how to measure it. So I have figured out part of what to measure. Let me say how to measure it you got to have measuring instruments. you got to have measuring strategies. One typical type of measuring instruments with which we are all familiar and we always make fun of paper and the pencil test. Okay, objective test, non-objective test, essay test, the primary test is a paper and pencil product. People have to write down something. It could be an essay they have to write down, or 
it could be a fill in the blanks, a short answer. What are the two types of measurement in training design in an enterprise planning context, things of that nature. And whenever you design a testing instrument, a measurement instrument, you also have to design a rating scale, a rating thing. So if I ask you a question, I should have the correct answers. I should say, these are alternative answers which are acceptable. I should also say, these are frequent answers which are incorrect, you should watch out for. And we make fun of the paper and pencil tests. So if you want to be nice, we can move on to performance tests. So at the end of this presentation, a performance test will be, can you come up with measure, with paper and pencil tests for these 18 objectives? So we actually have you do something, not talk about doing something, do something after you finish. I pull out my rating scale and check to see, does it directly and validly measure the objectives, things of that nature. So that is a performance test. And by the way, that's an immediate performance test if I do it as soon as today's session is finished. But immediate performance tests, immediate tests of any kind are extremely suspect because people have just heard you go blah, 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 and they remember it. And they're probably enthusiastic because they get inspired. So one of the things I learned from Guy is you always do a performance test some time later, a delayed performance test. Three months from today, I'm going to call you and say, hey, did you apply any of the ideas you got? And things of that nature. So, so much about performance test. Related to the performance test, instead of giving a simulated scenario and have people asking people, what would you do here? We can actually track people down and <clears throat> we can watch people on the job. I can track down three or four of the participants for instructional designers and I can watch them. I can see, do they spontaneously do measuring instruments or these measuring instruments more closer to performance test than invalid paper and pencil test. So I can observe what they are doing. I will not want them, I will just pull out this stuff. I will take what I think I will call work samples. And when they are not watching, I will look at the instructional design products and see how many tests do they have? Is it the necessary number of tests? So, and I can do a content analysis of everything they produce. So these are other kinds of measuring instruments. Ah, I can also conduct an interview, tell people which are the ideas you found totally useless, you are not able to use it. Which of these ideas that your manager said, don't waste stupid time doing those kinds of things. We don't need any tests. We don't need any evaluation. So that is an interview. And I'm interviewing the participants to see how strongly, how stubbornly are they standing for the valuable contribution from measurement techniques. If I talk to one person, one of you, that is an interview. If I talk to eight of you, that is a focus group. So 
these are different types of measuring strategies and instruments. Notice I'm de-emphasizing the paper and pencil test. It doesn't mean you should never use a paper and pencil test. And they do a lot of paper and pencil test and they try to go beyond the comprehension, the low level, and to see if I can test uh, the people's uh, synthesis ability, evaluative ability, problem solving, application, transfer, things of that nature. So these are different types of instruments and the strategies for how to evaluate. I almost completely fulfilled the commands given to me by Guy, but let me talk about the timing of measurement. Sometimes you do pre-test measurement. You do measurement before you take people through your training. You do an entry test to make sure the folks have the prerequisite skills. They know how to do multiplication, addition and subtraction before you teach them calculus. So do they have the prerequisite behaviors? You also do pre-test to see, have they already achieved the objectives for your test? So you can stop wasting your time and charging big bucks to teach them what they already know. So this is the input measure measurement before you do training. And obviously the opposite output measure at the end of the training, you find out what they learned and the can they pass your paper and pencil test? Can they do your simulation test, simulated test? Can they do an actual application item which you can observe in the workplace? So you do measurement before, you do measurement after, and just to charge your client some more, you do measurement during the training process itself. You keep count of how many people are falling asleep and how many people are taking copious notes with great enthusiasm, how many people participate in your activities, how many people ask you questions? How many people ask you stupid questions? How many people ask you intelligent questions, meaning questions for which you don't have an immediate answer? So you collect information, measurement, data before, during, and after. So that concludes everything I wanted to share with you. My goal is to get you uncomfortable, unhappy, feel guilty and say I got to do more about this, something along those lines. So the only thing which is left is for a guy to say thank you for sharing your insights with us today. That is so true. So let me say that. Thank you for sharing your insights with us today, Dr. Silasylam Tiagarajan, most, most people know you as Tiagi, but uh, thank you for sharing with us today, sir. Thank you, Guy Wallace. This is the end. You can go back to take a nap now. Thank you. Good day, sir. Good day.